Apologies in advance. I am uh, sort of losing my voice. Uh, I'm going to try my best to maintain my composure, however. Um, Camille Foster, a partner at a uh, media company called Free Thing. Oh, thank you. Some idea who I am. Um, delighted to be here today. Uh, firstly, wanted to thank Fire um, for this amazing event. Um, and thank all of you wonderful people for coming. Uh, and of course, the Village Underground uh, for joining us. Uh, you should know this is not a comedy show. Uh, there may occasionally be jokes. Um, I can't guarantee that. Um, and uh, I had a whole routine, like song and dance, which is totally not going to happen now because of the voice. Your loss, totally. Um, <clears throat> but we do have a fantastic event for you this evening. Um, essentially, the question that we're asking is whether or not there's a free speech crisis uh, on America's campuses. Um, and what I'm going to try to do tonight, I'm supposed to be the moderator, what I'm really going to try to do is just stay the hell out of the way so you can have these very erudite, thoughtful, interesting interlocutors engage with one another, lay out their perspectives, um, and give us something stimulating, and then quickly get to you guys so you can get involved in the conversation as well. Um, I, I, I wanted to first try to tee something up. Um, my own experience here, and just to get my biases out on the table, um, is of course I'm someone who cares deeply about free speech, as I suspect all of you do. Um, if you don't, you're a monster and you should leave immediately. Um, but I can say that amongst the folks who are here on the, uh, on the, rock, the, the dais, with the stage, the, at the tables, um, the, there is general agreement, and we haven't even talked about this, but I'm pretty sure that this is true, that free speech is a fundamental cornerstone for all of the freedoms that we enjoy. Our ability to discuss problems, to, to figure out solutions, to talk about politics, to engage and experiment with ideas, it's critical and it's vital. And in various ways, all of these people have been working towards protecting that idea and advancing that idea. There's broad agreement on that. I think there's broad agreement about something else as well, that a lot of the, water for you. thank you very much. Um, a lot of the circumstances that you all have seen um, play out on campuses um, that everyone here is concerned about those things. Uh, there's broad agreement that it is a bad idea when people are shutting down speakers on campus. Um, but the question here is, what are we actually seeing playing out? Um, is there, in fact, a crisis? What direction are perspectives moving on these issues? Uh, and fortunately, we have some very thoughtful people uh, who can weigh in on this uh, question. Um, so to my, I think this is my right. Um, I don't know what that makes it for you. Uh-huh, that's kind of a joke. Um, arguing in favor of the proposition, um, and, and we'll see to what degree, um, is Jonathan Haidt, who is a professor of social psychology at NYU. Yes, thank for the man. Stern School of Business. Um, also affiliated with the Heterodox Academy. Um, and seated to his right is Andrew Sullivan, writer at large for New York Magazine, former editor of the New York Public. Legend in his own right. I'm seated to my left, and I'm going to start at the far left, <clears throat> is decorated civil liberties veteran, uh, and CEO of Pen American, Suzanne Nossel, like Fossil, she told me. Yes? Yeah. Awesome. And seated to her right is the man of the hour, in a way, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Sachs, who is a lecturer in political science and history at Acadia University in Canada. Oh, Canada. Toronto Raptors got swept last night. Um, but Jeffrey kind of ignited this debate with a Twitter post. Um, and I think it's probably appropriate to allow you to start off. So we're just going to do some opening remarks, move through, and then get to the discussion. All right, sounds good. Uh, well, thank you all for coming here. Uh, but I have to say, I feel like we've been here before. Every decade or so, we seem to pick a new anxiety that we project onto college students. In the 1980s, they were rebellious, violent, anti-establishment. In the 1990s, they were apathetic slackers with no interest in current events. And in the 2000s, they were starry-eyed idealists, clutching participation trophies, waving them around, and totally, utterly unprepared for reality. Today, we're living in something of an illiberal moment in our national politics. So naturally, and seemingly with no self-reflection, we've shifted gears again. It turns out now that college students aren't rebellious loners. They're coddled and obsessed with playing the victim. They're no longer apathetic slackers. Suddenly, they're dangerous revolutionaries. They're not starry-eyed idealists. It turns out that they're bitter and relentless scolds. Shifts this sudden and sweeping should make us all skeptical. 
And that's why I think we're all here tonight. We all like to think of ourselves as skeptics, as people who won't get sucked into the groupthink of our friends on social media or the pundits on cable news. But increasingly, that's what the campus free speech crisis has become, a kind of groupthink based on unfocused feelings of alarm and moral outrage. Consider some of the numbers. According to a 2017 Gallup Knight Foundation survey, fully 70% of university and college students support an open and learning, open learning environment where they'll be exposed to offensive speech. They chose this over, quote, a positive one where offensive speech is banned. Now you might think 70% is still far too low. Well, Gallup posed the same question to all Americans in 2016 and found that students were actually more opposed to banning offensive speech on campus than the general population. 12% more opposed, in fact, which is significant for these kinds of surveys. Now, what I'm saying here is that students overwhelmingly and at a rate higher than the nation as a whole want to be intellectually challenged on campus and are willing to risk feeling offended in order to get it. Faculty overwhelmingly agree. A recent survey from the American Enterprise Institute, no liberal bastion, found that 93% of professors, 93, support an open and unfettered speech on campus. 80% believe that they should have total freedom to teach or say whatever they want in the classroom. And 67% of American faculty would support the expulsion or suspension for students who try to no platform an invited speaker. Now, typically, this is where someone else fires back, and this may happen in a moment, uh, saying something like, oh, sure, well, the vast majority of students are solid on free speech. The majority of faculty are solid on free speech. But there's a radical fringe that's creating a chilling effect on campus. Well, the great thing about this claim is that it's unfalsifiable. A radical fringe, by its nature, is, often, is usually too small to reliably measure. A chilling effect, insofar as it produces an absence, is often impossible to measure. It's still a powerful claim, though. And by the way, Jonathan, that's why I'm so grateful to have you here, because I can call on you to support me in this. In numerous speeches over the last six months, Jonathan has alluded to the fringe, but then declared that it is in decline. During his address to the Manhattan Institute last November, he himself argued that we have turned the corner on the campus free speech crisis, that 2016 and 2017 would be remembered as the low point, and that going forward, we should expect into 2018 and 2019 that this radical fringe would fade away. This was from Jonathan Haidt, and he's right. Stats from FIRE back him up. Campus speech codes are at an all-time low and continue to drop. The, I should say an all-time low for the last decade. The number of disinvitation attempts, which includes episodes of no platforming, peaked in 2016 during the heat of the American presidential election, but has dropped last year and so far has continued to fall in 2018. In fact, according to FIRE's own database, since January 1st, there have been a total of five attempted disinvitations. Five. Now, it's tempting. I know that it's tempting to take a few anecdotes and decontextualize statistics and spin them into a crisis, especially when that crisis flatters our own sense of nostalgia. It feels good, as strained as it sounds, to believe that the current generation of young people lacks our principles and integrity. But as we all know, quite notoriously, facts do not care about our feelings. We live in a country of about 5,300 colleges and universities and over 21 million students. That's roughly the population of Florida. And you will find in Florida all kinds of crazy, obnoxious, and alarming individuals if you're looking for them. And God knows the internet is looking for them because Florida man is notorious. We all know that these individuals don't stand for Florida. They don't threaten Florida. They don't discredit Florida. Now, I'm not asking you to be satisfied with the situation on campus or to pretend that everything is perfect and there are no problems. You shouldn't be, and it's not. What I'm asking is that we all take a deep breath, look at the facts with fresh eyes, and agree there is no campus free speech crisis. Thank you.
John, I'll allow you to open up for your side. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so, well, first, thanks so much to Noam. Is Noam here? Noam Dwarman? Right here. Noam, thank you. I think we all owe Noam a debt of gratitude for making this, this venue and these talks possible. Thank you for hosting this. Um, I'd like to thank Jeff for, for starting this debate. Uh, and starting, it, it just makes me feel so nostalgic um, having this debate in which we, we, we both refer to the data and we don't call each other names. Like, I remember this from back a few years ago. This used to be so common. But it's been great fun debating with him on Twitter. We're actually getting good reviews, like people saying, like, oh, this is the way things ought to be. So thank you for starting this and conducting it in such a civil way. Um, Thanks to, to Suzanne for running uh, PEN America, which put out a magnificent report in 2016, really laying out all of the issues, the moral issues, the historical issues, the legal issues, uh, the essential primer for understanding all of this multifaceted situation that we're facing. Um, now, what we are here to talk about is, is there a free speech crisis on campus? And we can all point to uh, anecdotes, we can point to uh, survey data, but none of it makes sense unless it fits into a narrative. And that's what the debate is about. That's what all debates are about in moral and political life. That's what uh, jurors have to decide when they judge uh, guilt or innocence. What narrative do they accept? So I'd like to put out three narratives that I think cover the terrain and you decide which one you think is true. The first one we can call the lost generation narrative. Um, and it is the one that, that uh, Jeff referred to as one that's out there that each each generation of older people thinks, oh, the young people today, they're, they're terrible, they're addicted to their, uh, you know, their uh, p you know, Pong games or whatever it was in the 70s. Um, and they've lost their minds, they, they're bad Americans. So, you know, this is a narrative in which a whole generation is lost. And if that was the case, then we could look at national survey data and we'd see a big drop in free speech. And what the, skept the skeptics, meaning Jeff first and then a bunch of others uh, came in af after him, um, <clears throat> what the skeptics have shown clearly, I think, is that that is false. There has not been, it's, it's not that kids born after 1995 have suddenly just like lost their minds and don't like free speech. On average, people have very, very high support for free speech, especially when it's expressed in the abstract. So I think we all agree that the lost narrative, the lost generation narrative is not true, but it is one you'll hear on right-wing media. So it is out there is valuable to push against it. In its place, <clears throat> Jeff has given you what we might call the skeptics narrative, which is that all we're experiencing is a typical moral panic. Moral panics, it's a sociological term, it's kind of like a witch hunt, it's, it's always on either the right or the left, they get upset about something that happened and they make a whole story and they make a whole set of facts. So what Jeff has told you is an internally coherent story about how there's nothing really going on except in the minds of the older generation or the crazy off-campus right. And you have to decide, does that narrative fit with what's happening in America today? Is it really true that nothing is wrong? Um, well, is it true that nothing is changing? There's no news about campus. The news is what's happening off campus. That's the second narrative. You have to decide if it's true. The third narrative is the one that I think is true. Um, and we can call it the new dynamic narrative. It is that the average student hasn't changed very much, but a few subtle tweaks, a few changes in parameters, and suddenly the whole system can reconfigure. And here's how it goes. A few terrible, terrible ideas have become more common recently. Um, they got into kids, not you know, kids didn't make them up themselves. They got in because parents and teachers told them in part. And so the first one we can call safetyism. It's the worship of safety. My kids are raised with safety, 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 sometimes from me and my wife. But when we say it, we mean don't get hit by a car. When their teachers say it, they mean don't exclude anyone. Don't hurt anyone's feelings. They wouldn't be safe. So kids are raised with the idea uh, that safety includes emotional safety, and they develop this idea that people are fragile, even if they're not fragile, other kids are fragile, and therefore, therefore, ideas like safe spaces, trigger warnings, microaggressions, these things only make sense if you think that your peers, your fellow students are so fragile that if someone says something, if someone quotes a scientific theory that they don't like, that they will be in danger. It's very strange to anyone over 25 or 28, but my claim is that these ideas are now common among younger people. So that's the first is uh, the assumption of fragility and safety. Is Lenore Skenazy here? Lenore? Thank you, Lenore. Lenore has done more than anyone to call attention to what happens if we tell our kids that the world is incredibly dangerous and they need an adult chaperone all the time. Eventually, they believe it. So that's the first. The second feature that has come in recently we can call intersectionality. Now, the original idea of intersectionality that 
identities are complex and overlapping and they intersect, they interact, is absolutely true and is useful and is not necessarily a, 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 da a damaging idea to the climate. But when you take young people, when you take young humans who have evolved for a bipolar way of thinking, good versus evil, good versus evil, us versus them, us versus them, that's the way humans are. And one of the great achievements of the 20th century, and I think Andrew will talk about the liberal tradition, one of the great achievements is that we found ways to dampen that down. But now in many schools, not most, not most of the 4,700 schools, but at most of the top schools, students are exposed to ideas in which they're told there are all these binary identities. One end is good, the other end is bad. And you put them together to find who are the really bad people. And so if we're telling kids to think in terms of good and bad, and you can tell who's good and bad by looking at them, this is a terrible thing to do, to moralize people like that. Um, and then the third feature that combines in the last few years to really make our thinking go haywire, or make some people's thinking go haywire on college campuses, is this new psycholegal doctrine that says it's not intent that matters, it's impact. It's not intent, it's impact. And so um, this idea, this is actually the doctrine of strict liability. So we see this idea in the courts. Strict liability is something that we apply to inherently dangerous activities like speeding, where not knowing the speed limit won't get you a ticket, won't get you out of a ticket, or using explosives or husbanding dangerous animals. In those cases, even if you didn't mean to hurt someone, if someone gets hurt, you will be charged because the law, it's such a dangerous thing. We have to hold people to the highest possible standard. But if we demand that speakers account for every possible reaction of every prospective listener, then the only sound strategy might be to keep silent. Now, for the last 90 seconds, I've been quoting Suzanne's wonderful essay in the Los Angeles Times where she recognizes that, my God, what have we done? We're treating speech as though it's handling explosives? And therefore, it makes sense to give everyone safe spaces, trigger warnings, et cetera. So you put these three things together, the safetyism, the intersectionality, and the idea that your intent doesn't matter. It's whether you hurt someone's feelings. You put those three together, what do you get? A call-out culture, call-out culture. Raise your hand if you don't know what this is, if you've not heard of a call-out culture. Okay, I go around on college campuses, I talk about it, and I say, do you have this here? And everybody says yes. I'll give you a little description. This is from a student at Smith, uh, writing in 2016. Um, she says, during, during my first days at Smith, I witnessed countless conversations that consisted of one person telling the other that their opinion was wrong. The word offensive was almost always included in the reasoning. Within a few short weeks, members of my freshman class had quickly assimilated to this new way of non-thinking. They could soon detect a politically incorrect view and call the person out on their, quote, mistake. I began to voice my opinion less often, to avoid being berated and judged by a community that claims to represent the free expression of ideas. I learned, along with every other student, to walk on eggshells for fear that I may say something offensive. That is the social norm here. So this is the new dynamic that I claim has descended on many colleges. We have 4,700 in this country. Many are commuter schools, many are, uh, are religious schools, uh, many are in rural areas where there's not political pressures. So if you look at the GSS or other national representative surveys, you don't see much of a shift in the average. But at schools, especially in the Northeast and the West Coast, and that's where almost all the explosions are, that's where the violence is, that's where most of the actual shoutdowns occur, at our elite schools in the Northeast and along the West Coast and in Chicago, the dynamic has changed so radically that students speak like this. And when I ask students around, when I speak, I say, is, do you recognize this? They say, yes. So this, I claim, is the new dynamic. Now, is it a crisis? Does this qualify as a crisis? Um, Andrew is going to do the main work of explaining why this is such a crisis for our society. But very briefly, I'll just say why it is such a crisis for our universities. Our two missions are research and teaching. If faculty now feel that they cannot, they cannot, there are no go zones, there are hypotheses that they just don't want to investigate. And if the data comes out the wrong way, they don't want to publish it. Or if they try to, it's harder to publish. And this is documented with experiments. If you just shift the conclusion of the finding, it's harder to get IRB approval. It's harder to get it published. So if we're having political pressures on our research, that means our research is not as good. It's not as reliable about controversial issues. And my god, do we need good social science research now in our country. Our second mission is teaching. 
Um, and if, if students come to school and they're afraid to speak up in discussion sections and in seminar classes, which is what I hear, then why are they paying this money? Why are they spending this time? They could get the same education um, just online if, there's no, if, if the discussions are not lively. Um, so uh, I will end with uh, Thomas Jefferson's words when he was founding the University of Virginia. And he said, uh, this institution will be based on the illimitable freedom of the human mind. For here we are not afraid to follow truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error so long as reason is left free to combat it. Now I joined the academy in 1987 when I went to, I showed up at graduate school at Penn in psychology, and I lived in this world. It was a very exciting world. It was great fun to play with ideas, to challenge things, to come up with even astonishing or surprising, uh, or even sometimes ide ideas that would offend the majority. We could do that, we had to do that. We had to uh, not respect sacred cows. But that is no longer the case. That kind of world, I believe, ended in 2015. Um, now, is that, a, uh, is that a tragedy? I would say it is, thank you. Suzanne? Great, thank you so much. So I run a free expression organization called Pen America, and our work is to defend free speech and open marketplace for ideas, academic freedom, and even the right to offend. And over the last few years, we have become concerned about what's happening on college campuses, invitations to speakers withdrawn, professors targeted for what they say. To respond, we've released this landmark report that Jonathan mentioned, a white paper, dozens of speeches, op-eds, and statements. I've argued against regulating hate speech and rejected the tendency to equate speech and violence. We've also convened four closed-door, sit-down symposiums with students, faculty, and leadership at the sites of some of the most pitched controversies over these issues in the country. University of California at Berkeley, Middlebury College up in Vermont, UVA Charlottesville, and College Park, Maryland. I'm sure many of you have heard about the incidents, uh, in some cases violent, that have happened on those campuses. But ra to, to our goal is not just to mount a defense of free speech on campus, but rather to mount a defense of free speech on campus that can appeal to a rising generation of students who are skeptical and questioning. We want to advance protections for free, free speech, not just in principle, but also in practice. So any debate has to start with definitions. Merriam-Webster says a crisis is an unstable or crucial time in which a decisive change is impending, especially one with the distinct possibility of a highly undesirable outcome. In heated debates, there can be a tendency to argue from anecdote, one that I hope we'll avoid tonight. So there are, uh, as Jeffrey said, 5,300 colleges and university campuses. So while I don't think a crisis would need to affect everyone, we would need to be convinced that it was roiling a lot of them. And the, the, uh, the definition of crisis also refers to a particular period of time. A crisis isn't something that can be ongoing for decades or simply a reflection of perennial trends. It needs to be an acute, decisive moment. So I'll just lay out quickly two arguments uh, against the idea that we face a crisis for free speech. Declaring a crisis of free speech misses what I think is really going on on campus. The major tensions that we see in our work erupting center on demands around diversity, inclusion, and equality. Periodic calls to ban speech are mostly a byproduct of these campaigns, not their central purpose. I would say that's true at the four universities where we've held those in-depth convenings, as well as at places like Yale and the University of Missouri. That's not to say that calls to ban or punish speech are right or justified, but rather that the best way to counter them is not by trying to ram the First Amendment down students' throats, but instead by taking a look at how and why our campuses are changing. So over the last 35 years, US universities have seen nearly a tripling of representation of students of color, from 16% to 43%, with white student percentages declining overall from 84% to 57%. Percentages of openly gay students, first-generation immigrants, undocumented students, and foreign students have also climbed. So it's not just about more students from diverse backgrounds, but also about the expectations and the experiences that they bring. The assimilationist model that prevailed for decades since campuses first began to integrate is being tested. Students are asking the universities to revisit traditions and established practices. These may be students for whom going home over break should not be an expectation, students who want to study the work of artists and writers who've historically been left off curricula, students whose gender, gendered identities don't conform, students who question clubs, fraternities, mascots, and building names. To those from an older generation, these changes can seem misguided and unjustified. What about great books and Western civilization, men's and women's rooms? 
But seen through another lens, these students are pushing forward the next phase of the civil rights and women's rights and other rights movements that have been ongoing for centuries. Why should they accept institutions that in key respects remain as they were originally constructed to cater to homo homogenous student populations? These students are asking questions and pressing for answers that previous generations never considered. Now change is hard, it can seem threatening, but today's students are gonna inherit our society. As we teach and groom them, it behooves us to listen to the extent that they're arguing that populations and groups ought to have more of a say in how they're being described and treated, would we really object? The key is demonstrating that their needs and interests can be advanced without compromising robust protections for free speech, and that indeed such safeguards are instrumental rather than inimical to the achievement of their goals. A second piece of context relates to bias and discrimination. So between 2016 and 2017, white supremacist activity on US college campuses tripled, with 147 incidents recorded just in the fall semester of last year by the ADL. Nooses hung in trees, racist posters in dorms talking about the need to defend the white heterosexual family. When racist speech or incidents happen on campus, people inevitably turn to students of color to explain why what happened was wrong to rebut noxious arguments, to find solutions. We often say that the answer to offensive speech is more speech, and I agree with that, but the demand for such speech can fall disproportionately on certain populations. In the current climate, with hateful speech on the rise, the burdens are heightened. These weights have helped dr drive the demand for that universities do more to ad address offensive speech. This brings me to a final point. Whether to define something as a crisis is subjective. Reasonable people can disagree, as this de debate demonstrates. Declaring a crisis of campus speech, I think, risks ignoring the larger context of the demands that students are raising. It can feed a sense of alienation that some students feel. They feel the First Amendment isn't for them, that it's useful only and gets bring up, brought up only to defend speech that targets them. Crying crisis can also fuel ill-informed responses. The last year has witnessed the introduction of a spate of campus speech laws in more than 17 states. Many of these would risk doing more harm for speech than good. These laws are often overbroad, mandate harsh punishments for counter speech or protest, or empower politicized panels to police campus discourse. So declaring a crisis risks prompting a cure that may be worse than the disease. This is not a prescription for passivity. The work of FIRE, of PEN America, of Heterodox Academy, and much more are necessary to ensure that the conflicts we're discussing tonight are mediated and remediated so that we can keep the campus open to both all people and all ideas. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Sullivan. Hi. <clears throat> I'm, I just I'm, I want to apologize a little bit for my voice. Um, I'm, I'm allergic to pollen. and. Uh, <laughs> DC right now is like an arboreal bukkake, uh, and I have a lot of tree come in my eyes. Anyway, on that note, uh, I want to. You you win. I I, <laughs> I want to um uh, uh try and draw back a little bit. Um, and look at this from the perspective of where I come from academically, which is in political thought. And I think that part of the crisis that we're dealing with is a conflict between two visions of the world. And the vision of the world that is in the ascendant is one that has always been the norm in human society throughout history. And that is that fundamentally, you are a member of a group. And that groups compete for power. And that in fact, everything in our society is really a function of these power structures. And these power structures used to be defined in classic Marxism as classes, economic classes. Currently, they are more often defined in terms of identity, things you can't help that you are, or things that you're proud of that you just happen to be, uh, your race, your gender, your sexual orientation, your gender identity. And the view is, and you can feel it not just on campus but everywhere, is that our society is basically 
a function of the oppression of some groups by other groups. And that therefore, the most important thing to figure out is who is oppressing whom. And the most important thing to do is to resist the powerful or the more powerful and to defend and protect uh, those with less power. And the power is a kind of invisible thing because it's not purely class, although class is mixed up with it. It is about how one feels about oneself and how one feels about other people. And so the most powerful group, and you can hear this in the rhetoric every day, a white, straight, cisgendered men. They are the ultimate oppressive force. And you can go down and there's a hierarchy and we can have all sorts of complicated ideas about who's where in the hierarchy. But essentially, that's what our society is. It's a constant fight between these groups of people. And in fact, because as a society we're becoming more and more diverse, the intensity of that fight is growing. We are and will be the first white majority country to become a, a non-white majority country in the history of humankind. These are very powerful psychic effects. And in those circumstances, and especially with incredibly divisive and polarizing political parties, we're beginning to see our entire society and culture governed by which group you're in and your ability to represent that group or to betray that group. And the notion that these groups have fixed interests and certain ways of thinking that distinguish them from one another. This is uh, essentially uh, draws its roots in Marx, but also in the, uh, in the critical theory schools, which are now taught as simply the truth in most universities. So we're concerned if there are too many white people on a panel. We're concerned if there are too many men. We're concerned if there are too many straight people. And speech affects power. So because this is so amorphous, if you say something that makes an oppressed group feel more oppressed, you're not just speaking, you're actually harming those people. Speech is not simply a way in which you're discussing things. It has immediate impact. It, it has harm. It commits harm against groups. It is a power play. And there is only power in this view of the world. All rhetoric is simply about defending your power or about seizing power for yourself. We are a tribal species. This comes very naturally to us. Uh, the history of humankind is really, in many ways, a story of these struggles between these groups. But there was an experiment in human history, uh, beginning sometime in the 17th century, of which this country is the ultimate product, which it says that, no, 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 no. This is not what we are. We are actually individuals. We have our own selves, and we construct our societies to defend ourselves as individuals, not as groups. That we therefore recognize, for example, freedom of religion as a fundamental right, because no group can tell you what to believe about the universe. We represent and defend private property, because private property is a way in which the individual is protected from the group and the mob. And we believe that when we're trying to figure out the truth in a society, the way we do that is argument, is we use reason. And it doesn't matter whether you're white, black, pink, purple, whether you're gay, straight, trans, bi, queer, asexual, you know, the rest of the alphabet. Uh, what matters is simply the cogency of your arguments. That's all. Have you made a good argument? Have you persuaded someone or have you not? And power is really less important than truth. And when you become a citizen of this republic, you're equal as anybody else, and that your opinion is worth something regardless of whether you're a man or a woman or black or white. In fact, those things are kind of left behind when we become simply citizens. I became a citizen recently of this country, and I wasn't, thank you. Took a, took a long time, but I got there in the end. Uh, and I didn't become a gay citizen. 
I didn't become a white citizen. I didn't become a Catholic citizen. I didn't become an English American. I just became a citizen, and my voice has no more power and no more valid validity than the strength and cogency of my arguments. Now, those two ideas are in direct conflict, and the forces of the group over the individual are immensely powerful right now as the society goes through enormous demographic change. And what matters, it seems to me, that in that process, that individuals, both in the minority and oppressed groups or in the oppressor groups, are allowed their own conscience, allowed their own voice, and treated no better and no worse than anyone else. And that's the conflict. Are you to be treated as simply a member of a group? Is your activity on a campus or in the wider world really a function of power? Or are you an individual capable of making up your own mind, sometimes bucking your own group, saying what you think, and having that being taken seriously on its own terms without being called to account for being a gay person or a straight person or a white person or a black person or all the other characteristics that accumulate onto us. That's what's at stake here. The silencing of individuals, the intimidation of individuals by those groups. The loss of imagination and understanding of our society as really one of equals and individuals rather than groups and power. That's really what's at stake. And that's why this is not just a crisis for the campus. It is a crisis for the general culture. It's a crisis whereby you can find people on the right and the left slowly being purged from positions of influence or from positions or platforms that they otherwise might have because they're violating the group norm, because they're saying something that the group doesn't like or because they're acting as if they have a right to say something, when in fact, because they are white or male, or because they're black or female or whatever, they don't have a right to say what they think in that particular circumstance. Those two visions are at war right now. You can see it everywhere. You can feel it. You can feel the air and the oxygen in most of journalism and culture becoming, having little less oxygen people being more likely to be called racist, sexist, homophobic, bigoted, blah, 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 blah. And in fact, that being the main argument that people use in rebutting other people's arguments. Uh, and that is what I think we need to resist, and that is what I think we're in danger of completely surrendering to. Thank you. Nico, Nico, in terms of time, how are, we, how are we looking for the conversation portion? Here? We're good. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Great. Um, well, this actually went a bit differently than I expected uh, in ways that I really like. Um, this really isn't a debate so much as a conversation. Obviously, we've gone well beyond the confines of the original question in some respects, and this makes a hell of a lot of sense. The reason we care about the Academy is because it has consequences and ramifications for society at large. Um, but I do want to return to some of the empirical things that the two of you addressed at the very beginning of the conversation. One thing that many people may not be aware of who haven't read the extensive back and forth that you all have had is that a lot of the conclusions that you're reaching independently about whether or not there's a crisis looking at the data, and a lot of this is survey and polling results, it's the same data, and you are reaching totally different conclusions. Not just there's a crisis, no, no, everything is fine, it's the same. It's In one case, it's everything might actually be getting better and maybe things are getting worse. Can you, I, I wanna get the two of you to just engage and give us a sense of what one another are getting wrong uh, and perhaps what one another are getting right. So I, I, we just ended with you, started with you. Sean, how about you give it a go? Sure, sure. Um, so yes. Uh, that's what so much of moral and social and political psychology is about, is how can we look at this, what we think is the same thing, and see completely different objects. And the, one of the most powerful principles there is called motivated reasoning or the confirmation bias. So a lot of what's going on is people who are on the left want to endorse a certain narrative, people who are on the right want to endorse a different narrative. Um, in this case, I think we're 
now that Jeff and I are particularly ideological, I myself am a, a centrist who uh, votes only for Democrats. Uh, I started Heterodox Academy because, not because I wanted to help conservatives, but because I saw the quality of academic discourse declining as we lost, uh, as we went from being about four to one left right to being now about 10 or 20 to one in most fields, left to right. Um, we lost the, the, the dynamics of dissent. That's why I and some others started Heterodox Academy. Um, and so there are, so what you need to know is that there are a, a number of national surveys, the GSS, the General Social Survey is the biggest one, that's really what started is Jeff did an extensive analysis of it. Um, but part of what happens is that the, the, data, the data doesn't answer your question directly, you have to interpret it. And Jeff started by interpreting trends about uh, people 18 to 35, which are mostly millennials. And so, well, who are the people we're talking about? And if we're looking at millennials, then the answer I think Jeff has shown is that there's not much is changing. Um, but my argument, um, uh, based on uh, the, this book that I've written with Greg Lukianoff and uh, work by Gene Twenge and many others. Oh, let's, let's have it, yes. Yeah. So Jeff, uh, uh, Greg is a friend of many people here in fire. Um, uh, is that kids born after 1995 do seem to be different on a lot of things. They were more overprotected, but most especially they were raised within an age of social media. And I think this is crucial for understanding call-out culture. But to return to the data, the point is, how do you define the question? And so we, we went back and forth over well, what's the relevant age that we're interested in. And then how are the questions asked? And if the question is, in general, do you think free speech is important? Well, the answer is always yes. But if you trade it off against, especially issues of durist and inclusion, so I think Suzanne is right that it's not that anyone's against free speech. It's that, well, most people are for diversity and inclusion in some way, shape, or form, but some people want to take it, want to say, this trumps everything else. And others say, well, you know, I have these different values. So, um, um, so even that aspect of it, what Suzanne brings in really does sharpen it. Yes, this is not about whether anyone hates free speech. Nobody hates free speech. It's about how you trade off values. Um, I would just like to respond to a couple of specific things. You know, Jeff and I could go on for days. We have gone on for days. Um, <laughs> but I just want to respond to just a couple of very specific things. It's probably uh, good to see just a little bit uh, dealing with the data. So first, um, um, Jeff said that um, a, a claim that it's a change in dynamic is not something that can be measured. Uh, it's a, you know, it's, if it's just about a few radical individuals. Um, but no, you can measure a change in, in dynamic. You, you look at questions about who's afraid to speak up and why, and while we don't have good longitudinal data, we do have very good data on who is afraid to speak up and why. At Heterodox Academy, we created the Campus Expression Survey. And I think, and Jeff did grant in his most recent piece, did grant that there is a big difference where people who self-identify as being on the right report very high levels of being afraid to speak up in conversations about politics, race, or gender. So we do have a lot of evidence um, that who's afraid to speak up is especially people on the right. Uh, actually, surveys in the tech industry are finding this also. It is creeping out into the broader, the broader culture. Um, another, just another couple of specific points. There's a wonderful, many of you know the Yiddish word chutzpah. You know, one definition of that is the, the kid who murders his parents and then asks for clemency because he's an orphan. You know that one? <laughs> well, um, I want to keep this friendly, but you got a lot of chutzpah. And just, the, reason, the reason is because, all right, so it's true that I did predict in a talk at the Manhattan Institute, I did predict that things were going to turn around. But the reason I predicted that is not because it's going to burn itself out. It's that in the first year and a half of this, not a single college president, except for Ohio State, not a single college president said, mm, you know, maybe you shouldn't shout people down, or maybe we're going to actually have some disciplinary punishments. No, they all basically validated the narrative or sat there quaking in their boots for the first year and a half. So there was no pushback, and if you don't push back against intimidation, you get more intimidation. And what I've been seeing in the last year is these college presidents are now finding their spines. Their, their donors are certainly saying, as, as I did for my alma mater, I ain't giving you a penny anymore. I can't believe what you've done. So um, my claim isn't that this is burning itself out. It's that after a year and a half in which there was no real pushback, suddenly now so many people are so horrified by what's happening. And I've talked to a number of college presidents. They're so horrified that they are beginning to respond. The majority does favor free speech and not shout downs, and they are uh, going to respond. Uh, a second kind of chutzpah thing is to say, as you did in your initial essay, things are going, things are getting better, they're going in the right direction. Look how few speech codes there are. Well, yeah, why do you think there's so few speech codes? Let's hear it for fire. Yeah. So, anyway, those are, those are my only real peeps. Everything else I think is great in our debate, but those two I thought were uh, not quite.
All right, well, let me jump into this. Um, Really quickly then, I mean, I certainly agree. You know, the efforts of FIRE have been instrumental, especially in eroding the reach of these speech codes over the last 10 years. And you can look at the relationship between the litigation and the workshops that FIRE has organized about these speech codes and the decline. It's a real relationship. And I grant that, absolutely. I'll also note that in your speech to the Manhattan Institute, it wasn't just the administrators standing up. You also go on to say the professors, the vast majority of them are opposed to these sorts of things. The vast majority of students are opposed to these sorts of things. And looking at that, looking at that kind of statement, it reads to me like we're talking much less about a kind of civilizational crisis, maybe to adopt the language that Andrew would use. And we're looking at more of a community in which people are increasingly realizing, hey, we have a problem, we need to push back. And I'm not saying it's not a problem. I just think we need to be realistic with our language. But, but let's just clarify, what do you think the problem is? Well, let me come back to that question. That, that's, a, that's a big one. Um, and that's fine. Let me go back to a couple other points about the data issue that, that you raised and how we can interpret the same data differently. The reality, and I, I think you would definitely agree with this, Jonathan, is that we don't have the data we need. We don't have, we don't have a lot the, of yeah. data, okay? Um, especially in the case of your argument, Jonathan, we're dealing with people born after 1995. You know, these are people who are, what, maybe 23 now or so. It's a small sliver of the American population for a variety, well, comparatively speaking, for a variety of reasons. It can be hard to survey. We have some instruments in the field that are giving us information. We need a lot, a lot more. Um, some of the problems, I think, especially focus on this issue of the absence of longitudinal data. We don't have a lot of data going over time, okay? And as a result, we can't really tell whether what we're seeing today in these surveys is new or whether it's something that's always been there. It might be one, it might be the other. Now, we will know more as these surveys age and as we get more data. We're lacking it right now. I also think that some of the data that's being collected is bad data. And here I actually do want to very gently call out your own campus expression survey, which has serious problems. I think you kind of acknowledge some of these in the way you write up that survey on your website. This is a survey that the Heterodox Academy put together into the field along with an organization called yourmorals.org. It is an internet opt-in non-representative sample. It collected somewhere around 483 Respondents, I believe, who all opted in. No, Sean is here. It was a. It's, it's over a thousand. It's over a thousand, but the. It's now over five thousand. Over five thousand. Now, when I looked at the data last time, and please correct me if I'm wrong, one of the issues in your 2017 findings, again, is that this data, uh, because it was non-representative, it had something like you know 390 odd white respondents and 10 black respondents. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. It's underrepresentative. And I think this is a real problem, right? This is a difficult population to survey. And uh, as a result, there's, there's data out there that I don't feel very comfortable using. I think the GSS, which you and I have gone back and forth on, is great because it's so rigorous, because it's longitudinal, it goes back to 72. So we have real data from there. It doesn't, I think, quite support the contentions you're making because, again, 18 to 34-year-olds in that survey, they lead the way in support for offensive speech. Can I, maybe, <clears throat> maybe I'll try to interject here just to, to bring a close to the, the technical aspects of the data. It seems like there's broad agreement that the data doesn't tell us everything that we need to know. And if we're trying to make firm conclusions about how things are changing on campus, the data might not tell us now Suzanne when you laid out your own perspective I mean I'm I'm aware of Pen America actually do, undertaking research and developing guidelines to try to help address speech issues on campus the expectation here the reason for Pen America and organizations like fire is because there will be situations that need to be adjudicated on campuses um, and addressed and people will need to have their civil liberties defended for whatever reason um, can you talk about the nature of the, the changes that you see taking place on campus and this sort of magnitudinal question as to whether or not there's a crisis in, and why PEN America specifically is making a determination that while we're seeing changes take place, while we are seeing a, perhaps a different kind of problem manifest on campus, we don't actually think that it's a, a, a crisis. Is that because, and I'm, I'm stacking questions on top of one another here, um, but forgive me, you can answer whatever you like, but is it because there are fewer incidents 
on campus or is is there something else that that leads us to believe that this is not a, a crisis perhaps that's something we can track a bit better than yeah say look I, you know i don't think this can be reduced to uh da survey data people you know at being asked a question in the abstract do you support free speech you know, do you feel at times there are things you, you know, you'd like to say and you can't say? I think there have always been things people, you know, may have wanted to say and couldn't say. There's some things you could talk about now that you couldn't. I mean, people are talking about in the whole Me Too debate, not that there aren't problems with it. People are talking about a lot of stuff they didn't, you know, that used to be completely silenced. Uh, LGBT and trans identities people are talking about now, you know, in ways they never could in previous generations. So, you know, there, there's sort of many examples that point in both directions. You know, when we've gone around, particularly to these four campuses that, you know, you might say, you, you know, people know about um, what happened in Charlottesville on August uh, 10th and 11th of last year uh, when white supremacists marched there and, uh, you know, the violence and the, and the killing that took place. You know about UC Berkeley and the violence that erupted when Milo Yiannopoulos and Ann Coulter uh, wanted to speak, and then they were denied the opportunity to speak, and then offered the opportunity to speak. They, I think most of you know about Middlebury, where Charles Murray, a Charles Murray uh, appearance basically got completely shut down and ended in violence directed toward him and a professor. At College Park, Maryland, there was a murder uh, that now is being prosecuted as a, a, a hate crime. So yeah, these are four of the places where these controversies have been the most intense. I, you know, I wouldn't say there's a crisis of free speech per se. I think there are roiling tensions on those campuses that go, you know, that are much broader. They do relate to some of the things that Andrew is talking about in terms of tensions around identity, changing demographics, changing expectations of how institutions should work, what the priorities should be, you know, what it really takes for people to be, to feel welcome but and look, fully look, able is to there, participate Is there actually campus. a debate going on on these campuses about these questions? Is there actually a debate about, say, trans issues on these campuses? An actual debate? I think there is, Andrew. There you is know, not. When, when, and when we the, go... The, when we go, is there even a debate about gay marriage or homosexuality that includes, for example, the views of half the country or at least a third of the country? Look, is we, there actually a debate about, uh, <clears throat> about race that actually gets at the, what's actually at issue in a deeply polarized country? Or is there not on these campuses? I mean, it, there isn't. You know, these and in fact, those who dissent are shut down immediately or terrified of talking about what they want to talk about. You know, and it's the same also in the media in general. It's it's same also in the media in general, where people are increasingly afraid of their jobs, fearful of, 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 of whether they're going to continue as a writer, People are having to go through and living in newsrooms or magazine centers where the pressure for people to adhere to politically correct norms, to, to utter the same phrases and frames that echo the exact kind of ideology I talked about in terms of groups and in terms of identity. Uh, the notion that something should not be published because it will offend certain people, that it will offend certain people within the actual staff of the organization in such a way that you can't publish it. Uh, people are being fired, people are being hired and then immediately fired because they're violating certain norms in terms of what, uh, what, what the social constructionist understanding of, of human life is about. This is going on all over the place and you're pretending there's no issue at all. Of course there's an issue. You've asked me a lot of questions. I don't know if you're willing to give me a chance to answer some of them, but I'd appreciate it if you would. You know, I'm not saying there's new issue at all. I began by saying we've done a lot of work on this because we think there are serious issues. But I think you know, we're also living in these campuses exist in the United States of America. So the idea that with Republicans and conservatives controlling all three branches of government, that ideas that are racist or sexist or misogynist are out of bounds, can't be spoken about in our society, I think it's just false. You know, we've, we've got uh, dominant perspectives in the media from the White House articulating all of those ideas, so they are being debated But in they're this not society. talking to each other, and that's what I'm talking about. It's and in fact, those in institutions in which those two poles can actually communicate are becoming fewer and fewer. They're being purged, so they become purer and purer representatives of their own tribes. Yeah, That's what's going point, on. Andrew, so you're not even talking about universities. You're describing 
the Atlantic. You're striving Kevin Williamson. You're alluding to this. I'm trying. I'm talking about the New York Times. The fact that the op-ed editor of the New York Times can't run things he wants to run without huge uh, yeah. backlash. And, and it's I'm relevant. Talking about, yeah. I'm talking yeah. about Slack groups in newsrooms and elsewhere in which the pressure being brought upon individual writers is becoming so intense they're in tears or they're, they're having to quit. I'm talking about the chilling measures in which this kind of Andrew, atmosphere is preventing <coughs> younger people yeah, from let me, speaking let me offer their mind. A little bit of, little bit of perspective on this. I just want to quote a couple of okay. the PC movement replaces old prejudices with new ones. It declares certain topics off limits, certain expression off limits, and even certain gestures off limits. That was George H.W. Bush in 1991. Students at various campuses have told me they have learned to keep their heretical ideas on such subjects as affirmative action and abortion to themselves rather than be treated as pariahs. 1990, Nat Hentoff. So, you know, I don't think you're wrong, but this is always, we've always had taboo subjects. We've always had polarization. We've always had you know, some degree of self-censorship around controversial no, topics. No, something on, on, different on has campus. changed within the ideology. But you it, know it and I but know it. Does, it. But it seems, it seems we have to acknowledge that it's at least fairly difficult to quantify. And, you know, in my own experience, I remember I was at Rutgers last October and you know, I'm not too long out. Yeah, go Rutgers until I finish the story. Um, I, I show up on campus, and I'm not so long out of college, um, but I'm going to an event to speak, and for the very first time, I find myself going through this security gauntlet where I have to have all of my belongings checked along with all of the students and the faculty, um, and this feels very different to me. Um, and not only that, then when the event begins, there are folks shouting at me, and they are trying to disrupt the presentation because they're not interested in what I have to say. I mean, I remember hosting events while I was in college, and, and that didn't seem to happen. Now this becomes anecdotal, but in a universe where you do have this sort of contentious political environment, it does become easy to create this narrative. How can we possibly make just a firm determination, you know, without without spidering out to the other various issues, how, I'll, I'll ask the questions in reverse, how can you know when there is a free speech crisis if the data isn't telling us, and the opposite question to the other side, how do we know when things are okay if, in fact, there is always this subtle undercurrent of uncertainty about the things that are safe to say? You know, one of the answers, you know, questions we asked is like, can we actually go to these campuses where these, you know, uh, kind of frightening events have happened and bring together administrators, students from all sides. We have students from Federalist Society, from college Republicans, very left-leaning students, Black Lives Matter students, faculty experts on the First Amendment, you know, very left-leaning faculty uh, who are all, you know, focused on issues of intersectionality. Can we get them into the room and sort of have a civilized discussion about these questions? And, the, you know, the answer has been yes. They've been difficult discussions, but people will sit down, you know, uh, the discussions are pretty open. Uh, people are in debate and dialogue with, that, with each other. You know, I think one sign of a crisis would be if you tried to come with that agenda and people weren't willing to come into the room. Well, it seems like there have been incidents like that, though, right? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking like Emory University, where someone writes 2016, Trump 2016, which, again, I'm citing an anecdote here because the data is somewhat paltry, and I'm, I'm not quite sure what else to grapple onto. But So you've given me a specific example. Like, we bring people to campus. I mean, do you have any thoughts on, on when sure, you would I know mean, if there was a crisis? Well, let me give you guys another anecdote. This one is about a week and a half old. Milo Yiannopoulos and two lesser luminaries in the alt-right firmament, uh, what are their names, uh, Feckles or something like that, and uh, Sargon, Flank, thank you. Why do you know that? Fleckus and Sargon of Akkad, right? We're talking- So the get real, him out of here. The real dregs. Get him out of here. Yeah, get him out. Guy. We're going to purge you from the institution. These are the dregs of the alt-right. I'm just going to say it right now, okay? And they, all three of them, came to uh, Cal Poly San Episcopo about a week and a half ago, and I was dreading this, because the last thing I wanted to do was walk into this debate tonight with a fresh headline about campus SJW snowflakes shouting down Milo. It would be a disaster for me, okay? That's why I was on, you know, a tent hooks waiting for this to happen. Let me tell you, there's a reason why you didn't hear about this anecdote. Nothing happened. There were police called it from across the state. They had spotters on the roof. There was chain link fence surrounding the auditorium. There were five protesters, people, okay? Everybody else was at a concert on the other side of the quad having a great time. It was the most boring hour, I'm sure, of Milo's life. He loves the controversy, and he got none of it that night. These stories happen 
all the time. We just obviously never hear about them because they're not sexy. They don't make the news, and they don't appear in New York Magazine. What you Andrew's also column. don't under, what you also don't hear about is the people who were never invited. Ah, in which you can have in right, which you can have change because of this. In, in which you can have these safe spaces. Which the entire university is one in which there is really no debate about certain topics. Certain, and in fact, in, in which the idea of a debate is some lunatic like Milo representing some fight, as opposed to some actual debate within the faculty or within the university itself with reasoned conservatives, reasoned liberals. Look, I, I'm working in journalism, and I feel this so intensely every day. You know, I, I could say with the hot, like Red State, for example, a big blog, if seven people were fired because they weren't uh, pro-Trump enough. Uh, I, I work at a magazine, New York Magazine, in which someone wrote a column this week saying, why are there any right of center writers actually published in New York Magazine. Uh, the, 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 the Atlantic had an open forum in which the editor said that if they were considering a piece, he would, and it might affect a particular minority or might affect women who are a majority of the staffers of the Atlantic, apparently, um, that uh, he would make sure that they were consulted first to make sure that they weren't offended. Uh, this is, and the, the way in which this is enforced informally is, is, is we have at the New York Times, for example, a gender editor, something completely new, who, whose job it is to police every piece in that to make sure it conform, conforms with a certain understanding of what gender is, that there is no natural difference between men and women, that there are, that there are no, that, for example, something like the LGBTQ community exists, which is entirely a fiction, uh, that, that this ideology is baked in at this point in the most mainstream media, or it is siloed into an increasingly right-wing uh, media and an increasingly left-wing media in which there is no actual interaction whatsoever. And look at Twitter. This is the other thing. Look at where much of our discourse is happening. The, the mob mentality, the, the way in which people want to find not a way to out-argue someone or to disprove them, but to anathematize them, stigmatize them, and in fact, in most cases, get them fired. That is now the prevailing atmosphere in the biggest, uh, the biggest public area of discourse that we have. And you, you know, you can see that. Is there any real exchange of views going on? That is what we're talking about in terms of freedom of speech. It's not that, obviously, the government is not impeding free speech. We have a First Amendment. In other countries, however, in, my, in my, the country I grew up in, there are roughly nine arrests a day for, of people, arrests and detentions of, for, for, peop, for things that people have said or written. Uh, that is now where we're at, because they've offended some, some minority group or other. Uh, is there anywhere in mainstream American, in the mainstream media, for example, in which trans issues are genuinely debated? Can, can I pull back a bit yeah. <clears throat> before, we, before we try to answer that very dangerous question? Um, <laughs> actually, I'm stacking the deck there by doing that. Um, the, the question that I asked about campus and when we can know that there isn't a crisis, how we might be able to tease that out, what we might expect to see, it, it certainly, Andrew raised um, the question of the media and its response to Jeffrey. And I think about Richard Spencer, who has an event on campus, and in many cases, there are more journalists there than there are students who are actually interested in hearing about this. Th there does seem to be sort of a, 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 a general hysteria when it comes to the media and their interest in finding and confirming this particular narrative. Have we frightened ourselves to death, and how would we know if that were the case? Yeah. So there, there is a moral panic. Jeff is right that there is a moral panic, um, but that doesn't mean that there's not a very serious problem as well. How would we know? Um, as Jeff said, we don't have, the ideal data would have extensive measurement of students' attitudes about all sorts of things in the years before 2014, and then the same questions in the years after. That's what we don't have, unfortunately. Now, I think between Jeff and me and Sean, we've done a great job of like looking everywhere and combing, you know, bringing out what data there is. We've come to conflicting views. I invite you all to uh, read our com our competing articles. If you go to heteroxacademy.org, our blog posts are there on the home page. They have links to Jeff's. Uh, so there's a, a lot to read. Uh, you can look at the conflicting graphs. The reason why we created the Campus Expression Survey, Sean and I, um, was because we need measurement, not just of like people who come to website, we need measurement at a whole school. We created that survey so that any college president who decides 
let's find out what's going on at Amherst or Smith or Holyoke or anywhere else, can send out the link to the whole campus and say, here, how, you know, how free do you feel about speaking up? We're gonna pick up political issues, we're gonna pick up also racial identity issues. Or we want everybody to feel comfortable speaking. And so again, I really wanna emphasize what Suzanne said in her opening remarks. We have to settle the, the free speech dynamics question along with the racial inclusion and other identity inclusion issue. They are all related, you're absolutely right. So we need good measurement. How will we know when things are improved? One, if, if the, if the uh, um, data on the campus expression survey at a particular school show either low levels of fear or dropping levels of fear, that would be great. Um, if people can plan to bring a speaker to campus who um, is maybe right of center and they don't have to worry about physical security, um, one event, I've spoken to a number of schools now, whenever there's a free speech crisis and violence on campus, they, there's, you know, they call me or others to come to show, look, see, we can have you know, controversial, as though I'm controversial because I'm, I don't know what I am, but, um, but you know, there's elaborate security precautions. And the point is that even if there's only a few dozen cases that had real, uh, you know, only a few had real violence, but if there's a few dozen that are really dramatic, every, every college president is now thinking about this. And so uh, Andrew mentioned, what about the talks, that the, the invitations that didn't happen? The invitation policy is changing. There have been, as far as I know, no conservative politicians or anybody invited to speak at a commencement or given an honorary degree in a very long time, none. I think that's true that it's zero. Uh, because who would take the risk? Yeah, well, you're actually speaking to something that I heard you address in another, um, another context, just the, the changing political composition of faculties on campus, and Jeffrey, I'm not sure if this is something that you've um, responded to in your work. I, I think you've addressed it, but it'd, it'd be useful to talk about it again here. Um, what do you make of the fact that there does seem to be a pretty dramatic swing? Um, you, actually, I, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but you referenced something between the 1990s and today. Yeah, the big change between the mid-90s and 2010, when the greatest generation retired, there were many Republicans who went on to get PhDs after World War II, uh, so there was a lot of diversity until the 90s. Once the greatest generation retired, were replaced by baby boomers, especially in the social sciences, the numbers went became astronomical. So in my field, social psychology, it went from four to one left-right ratio in the 90s to now 17 or 18 to one is the latest figure. Yeah, I mean, there's no question, and, and Jonathan has done the yeoman's work on this issue, that there is a clear imbalance in terms of political ideology uh, in the faculty. It's a pretty uh, quick shift. I mean, it's a I mean, there's always been dramatic. an imbalance. I mean, there's one. Yeah. Uh, like, Imbalances are fine up, up to a right. point. Yeah, there's like there's a hallmark study from the 1990s that found using data from the 1990s, although it came out in the 2000s, that found something like a four to one liberal to conservative ratio. I've seen six to one in some cases. One study from about I think maybe four years ago, you might know better than I do, uh, found that in New England alone the ratio is 28 to one. Yeah, New England's right? really different. New England, and there's a, there's there's lots of possible hypotheses going on there. We're talking about small liberal arts colleges with a very strong ethos, rightly or wrongly, of a certain kind of mission for themselves. Who knows quite what's going on? Now, there are lots of... The mechanism at work for explaining why the faculty is so imbalanced is actually disputed. We don't know precisely what's going on. To some extent, it might be self-selection. It might be that people who uh, are in the process of going through graduate school, maybe uh, the environment is one that attracts liberals. Maybe it's the case that conservatives are more interested in entering other spheres like law or business or medicine. There are a lot of hypotheses that are have the, the, the you know, a tint of a kind of censorship or purge going on and ones that are just harmless, natural processes. Here's he, he the reason. It, oh, when, well, we have an answer. Yeah. All yeah. right. Wait, please, please I got, I got just one of the reasons. I got, a, I got, a, I got an answer for you. Um, that when someone who is right of center issues an opinion in such a context, he is not or she is not told that she's wrong for this and that reason. He or she is regarded as an anathema, as a moral monster, as someone who believes in, who is a racist yeah, or a white, or at this bigger. point, not just racist, but anybody who doesn't adhere to a certain leftist ideology is a white supremacist. This is language that's used all the time. Concept creep. These are, yes, these are deliberate rhetorical strategies to make sure that thought is policed and that everybody thinks the same thing. And that has reached a tipping point on campuses. And those, those generations in the last three or four years have gone into the media, which happens to be now in such economic dire straits that it's overwhelmingly disproportionately populated by young people 
people being paid almost nothing to churn out articles about who and what is sexist or racist or homophobic, which is, which, which when you actually, when you actually go from website to website on the web, that is basically all you get all the time. Uh, because that's the only thing they know. Because that's the only politics they actually believe in. And of course, it's so emotionally satisfying. Instead of addressing an argument to say, well, you can't say that, you're, you're white. We've only got a few minutes before we go out, Suzanne. I wanted yeah, to give you a Yeah, just quickly on that point, you know, well, why is it over the last couple of years that people have come to conflate you know, some bona fide conservative arguments with white supremacy. I mean, nobody was talking about white supremacy, you know, until the last year and a half. And it's because of our our, our president. No, I it's because of people like it's because of writers like Tanahasi Coates redescribing <laughs> redescribing uh, multicultural America as nothing having changed since slavery and segregation. And that so. rhetoric, the rhetoric being as, used, at least as much because people are going with tiki torches, you know, around well, actually, the, the uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. They they oh, feed the support. They feed Moderators, on each. They Moderators obviously feed on each other. You're you're both wrong, actually. Um, <laughs> 1980s James Baldwin was using precisely the same sort of language, white supremacy, well, to describe the phenomena ever, the of being in the United States, living in a country whose institutions have been quote unquote shaped by racism. This is an idea, however, that it has gained a great deal of currency, and that currency does, in fact predate Donald Trump. Um, it's certainly the case that we're all a lot more interested in these questions because of the current Trump phenomena. And for that reason, since we're all interested, I think we'll throw it out to you guys, allow you to ask some questions. Um, can you, and, can and you hear me back here? I can. All right, I can't gonna, see any damn Yeah, back. we're going to go around the room and make sure we don't ignore anyone okay. in the back or the front. So we got a question back here. You're going to have to throw things at me when... I know you can't see me yeah. because of the spotlight. And yeah. I would ask you, so please keep your questions. For me, actually. Keep your questions in the form of a question. I will take the microphone away. All right. Hello. Uh, I'm behind the pillar, but I have a question for Andrew. Uh, I can't see you anyways. So that's fine. Whatever. Uh, my question is basically, I, whether you've defeated your own point on, on the matter of, you're saying that uh, it's a bunch of sort of random young 20-something-year-olds talking about relevant subjects and in the media and yeah, at colleges, it's kids studying fundamentally relevant things like gender studies or whatever. And the question is, yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're maybe right that they're marginalized because they've marginalized themselves. Um, but how does that amount to a crisis? And I, I mean, I feel like you've had a, a very beautiful and salient failure to address the motion. By <laughs> design. Um, uh, it's, well, I mean, let's, I mean, we could debate forever about what crisis means. It does feel as if there has been a tipping point in which, in which writers, for example, are incredibly scared to talk about what they really feel, uh, to write pieces that are risky, that may offend their own tribe, uh, that may get them ostracized socially. The way in which ideas are becoming understood to be moral actions and in which we can't just debate over whether, I can, I'm sorry, I can't see you, so I can't really talk to you, uh, whether something is right or wrong, or whether someone is good or evil. That, that shift in the debate, which has been, I think, intensified by both sides in a tribal pattern that is intensifying, in which in elite circles specifically, and you can look at the polling data about what's happening in the country at large, there is increasingly one incre in increasingly ideological point of view and in the other, another one in, in the opposite direction. And these things are actually correlated with things like race and gender and even sexual orientation. And that is a very dangerous thing. We are not talking to each other. We're talking at each other. But can, can, um, I, can I just add on? Because yeah. I, I think he's going to accuse you of still dodging the question about whether there's a free speech crisis on campus. So can I, like, I just... Uh, sure. Because you basically have explained it. I just need to put in one link. Sure. So it goes like this. Think about the state of our democracy right now. How healthy is our democracy? Is it kind of a mess? Now, imagine, imagine that the next generation coming along, the one that's in college and just beginning to graduate, imagine that they come out and they, many of them, especially at the elite institutions, have learned not to make arguments. They were not raised in that culture Andrew described in which it doesn't matter what your race or sex is, we go by your argument. No, they have learned how to make ad hominem arguments. That's what they do. You find a thousand ways to link the person to racism, sexism, or white supremacy without necessarily directly accusing them of it, but rhetorically, it shuts them up. 
So imagine our democracy already on the brink, already in very bad shape, and now these discourse patterns that Andrew is seeing in the youngest journalists, and you're going to see it in the creative industries, and they're seeing it in tech. This is coming out. It's going the places where the elite college students go are now taking on college culture. So yes, this is a crisis because Andrew is seeing it creeping off of campus, coming to a business near you. Well, look at, look at. The, the, corp, the corporate culture at this point, corporate culture, is, insists that if there is any imbalance in a corporate employment or hiring that doesn't perfectly reflect the demographics of the entire of country, it is obviously a function of systemic racism or sexism. And if you stand up and say, well, hold on a minute, why are you, why are you hiring only women at this point? Uh, and, you, uh, 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 and they say, well, because we're ad addressing our inherent sexism. You said, maybe there isn't inherent sexism. Maybe, in fact, this is a choice, or maybe there are other forces at work. You are fired <laughs> by even expressing such a thing in a corporate context, expressing well, the notion that there are differences between fundamental differences between men and women, or even uh, talking about the differences in cultures and dynamics of different ethnicities, which might lead them to different professions. All of this is not just debatable. It isn't debatable. It is a, it is, it is a condition for you being fired. I will we know this. We've I will agree, Andrew, this much. I will say this much, that there is a free speech crisis in corporations, in the private economy. You are... You have, for those of you who work for the private sector, you have zero free speech rights while you're on the job, and increasingly your business has the ability to censor you outside, to control, to terminate you for speech that you do extramurally. Now that is a crisis, but I will note, I mean, this is a crisis that uh, is aided and abetted increasingly by a corporate culture that's obsessed with uh, its image. And that's something we should be concerned about. Campus Students on campus, though, they live in the real world. They don't have the protections. They don't have the protections that we enjoy in our private sector. They don't have bosses who protect them from offensive speech. That's my hot take, everybody. The fact of the matter is, is that if you're a college student, you deal with stuff on a daily basis where you live, eat, and sleep that the rest of us who work in the private sector never have to live but through. My point is the corporate culture is a direct reflection of the college ideology, that it's been imported wholesale. Well, it has to be a reflection of something. Well, let's, let's get another question from the audience. I suspect there are some. Okay, someone back, uh, back here again in the middle. Go for it. Uh, I just want to thank all of you for coming out, by the way. I think you've all raised some wonderful points. I'm a little better off hearing. Um, but my question is for Jeff, uh, specifically. Hi, I'm back here. I don't know if you can zoom. Hello. Um, so, you brought up a, a talk recently that I think you said featured Milo, Fleckers, and Sargon. Now, I don't think any of the people that you've mentioned are uh, particularly uh, worth listening to on an intellectual level or are going to enlighten anything. However, you did refer to all of them as alt-right. And I think what you may have done is sort of reflected one of the issues that we find in that all of them are very vastly different. Um, and also someone like... And I know this just from a cursory Google. Um, Fleckers, for example, is a straight conservative pro-Trump. That's it. So how far right is alt-right? Like, if you're someone that supports the Republican Party, how are you alt-right? What is alt-right? Like, surely alt-right is once you outstep the bounds of what's acceptable within the political sphere. Um, and I just think if you're going to use the term to dismiss someone, you shouldn't, you kind of know what it means. Yeah, I mean... Where do we draw the lines on what is considered the alt-right? Actually, I'm not a fan of the term, and maybe I shouldn't have used it in this case. But I'll, let's, let's be honest. I mean, the ideas being pervaded by Milo in many contexts, I think, would strike probably most people in this room as fairly odious. And I don't really have a lot of interest in getting into a debate now. We're in about, New York City, so, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't have a lot of interest in getting into a rich debate right now about the minutiae of Milo's position. Um, I do think that you know the alt-right is not a group of people that should be forcibly shut out of our public sphere. Nobody should be. We should have open and robust debate. Um, but I don't think there's any reason why I can't label certain people as offensive to me. <clears throat> or I think being... the question that's being asked here is, is something else that we've seen. It's the fact that the MAGA hat is in fact racist. My my designer sneakers here that I'm wearing, Yeezy 350s, this is the first version. Um, Yeezy. The, 
Yeah, they've become a political statement because Kanye West decided to don a MAGA hat. Feel the dragon energy come from it, this part Yeah, of the exactly. I, I bought these way before he started wearing MAGA hats. He was only doing Confederate flags at the time. But in either case, it, the fact is that this is racist, that voting for Donald Trump, that supporting the Republican Party presidential candidate, even in instances where he's not doing something that is explicitly racist, which is in fact possible. It's, in, it's physics. <laughs> totally true. Like These things are racist. Doesn't that suggest that there might be a problem? If we can't measure it empirically, that at a minimum suggests that maybe there's a problem. And I suspect if it's a problem in public, it's probably a problem on campus as well. I mean, it's a polarized moment. So there is demonization, I think, on both sides. There's a tendency to sort of conflate you know, people together and uh, Tar everybody with a broad brush, you know, whether you're calling people snowflakes or, you know, uh, uh, coddled, you know, and I'm, I'm sure Jonathan, who's used those terms, would agree that that doesn't account for all the students. There's some students, you know, we've worked with who come from really tough, difficult backgrounds who are at the forefront of these fights. So, you know, there's that tendency in this sort of debate to paint with a broad brush. We should try to avoid it. What, what, is there any concern, for example, that a writer, uh, <clears throat> in a mainstream magazine um, who might be pro-life um, could be hired and then fired, not for something he wrote in the magazine or for anything that he did at the magazine, but because certain members of that magazine found something he had said in another context offensive. Now, obviously, that doesn't offend the First Amendment. It's nothing to do with the government. We're not ta- I'm not... I'm not talking in that way at all. I'm talking about the way in which discourse is being slowly strangled of diversity, real diversity, in which the more it becomes actually ethnically or demographically diverse, the less intellectually diverse it becomes. That, that an important institution like the New York Times doesn't have a single columnist who, for example, supports reducing legal immigration, a massive um, something that is in- incredibly popular in the country at large. In fact, that, that if you were to do such a thing, if you were to argue that immigration should be, should be lowered, legal immigration, uh, you would be regarded as a white supremacist, period, in which ta Coates can say that everybody who voted Republican is a white supremacist. Now, I'm, he, he, he slightly... He that. slightly... He slightly qualified that, but he almost went that far. Uh, and how, how worried are we about that kind of culture in which our institutions that represent, supposedly represent the elite in general are simply deeply intolerant of any ideas that are reflected by maybe 40% of the population? Maybe we can uh, <coughs> chain together a pair of questions perhaps from the audience. To yeah, try over, to over here, Camille. I don't know what's going on. I don't even know where over here is. So. Very eager to ask a question over here. So I'm going to give it to All right. You. Uh, to what degree uh, does social media, the, the immediacy of social media, affect the, uh, the, the kind of the, the hyperbolic nature of some of these statements that people make uh, on, on both sides? Uh, and and um, and and what can be done to make it fail? Many sides. <laughs> I can respond to that because we we just at PEN America issued last week a field manual on online harassment that is aimed for journalists and writers and really anybody who's targeted by online harassment. So I I mean, this is where I agree with Andrew. I think, you know, the, the intensity, the ferocity is censorious. You know, when you go out there with a controversial opinion, wittingly or not, you know, you could trigger a firestorm that is silencing. And it's not government silencing. It's not a corporation silencing it. Saying every single responsive tweet is itself an act of free expression. But collectively, you know, the pylon can uh, be very intimidating. I think that's, you know, that's one piece of it. It's, it's a polarized culture. You know, I think there's, you know, there are real problems. I mean, we have a crisis. You know, if we were debating whether there's a crisis in journalism or the mainstream media, you know, we might have a different uh, set of conclusions or a Alignment here. I think you know to, to ask that uh, you know we count on college students to correct that, and, and that you know the lack of confidence that they'll correct that you know amounts to a crisis of campus speech. I don't. I, I think there's a missing leap of logic there, but I think social media is a huge part of it. Yeah, I think it is. I, th- I think it cannot be underestimated. I think it has changed. It is one of the things that has catalyzed what I think is an intensification 
of the way in which thought and, and speech is being described not as simply a way in which to advance an argument, but a signal of your virtue or vice, of whether you are a good person or a bad right, person. Right, very useful terms are virtue and, signaling or moral grandstand. Yeah, and that is, that's a, and people will talk about let's ratio somebody. <laughs> As if that is that means that you overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly dislikes as opposed to likes, and you can see the mob decided this person is wrong. <laughs> let's all go get that person. Um, let's destroy that person. Let's demonize that person. And this is going on, and it, and it's facilitated within workplaces and within journalistic institutions through Slack channels, through the the media, where in which. Uh, People have, you'll notice, for example, that in most mainstream magazines and newspapers, the people who are actually in any way debating the question or in any way in dissent do not actually work in the office. The, the sheer psychological toll of not being a leftist in a mainstream media magazine, magazine or newspaper is quite intense, and deliberately so. Um, this, this kind of mob mentality has been unleashed by social media. It's a swarm, and it's an intimidatory swarm that is slowly constraining the discourse, or rather not just constraining the discourse, but pushing that discourse into the dark web, into places where it's still continuing, but where it is not mediated or in any way mitigated by interaction with other ideas. Yeah. So and I, I that, think, is, yeah. that is a dangerous situation. I think a very useful, two useful words for us to be talking about here are intimidation and cruelty. Um, these are features that were never part of academic life uh, until very recently. <laughs> well, oh, okay, I'm sorry, you're right. They, they, in the humanities at the uh, MLA conference, I'm sure it was there. But in psych my field, social psychology, was very healthy. It really wasn't part, a big part of it. Um, what I'm saying is that uh, what social media has enabled us to all be incredibly cruel to engage in, in mob tactics. And of course, the right is extremely guilty of it. The, uh, the off-campus right specializes in these uh, things organized in 4chan and, and, and uh, by anonymous people, often involving incredibly racist and, uh, and violent uh, uh, um, charges against somebody who, who, whose name gets spread around. So the problem exists on both sides. But the problem on campus started before that was really an issue. The, this new dynamic emerged in 2014, 2013, 2014. Greg Lukianoff came to me and said, this weird stuff is happening. And this was not because Donald Trump or the alt, nobody knew what the alt-right was. They didn't exist then. Um, th this new morality, the new call-out culture was sort of accelerating in 2014, 2015. It then spread very widely in 2015. And so the, the thing I just want to emphasize here is that while this is a movement that um, that may have good intentions. It is trying to Im improve issues of diversity and inclusion. So all the things in Suzanne's report are, are correct, that this is really what's driving it. But what I think is really striking about this movement on campus is that while it says that it's about compassion, it's actually incredibly cruel. The way that people will identify anyone who steps out of line and then destroy their reputation with no concern for what actually happened. So I think this is something we're seeing on campus life. These universities are special places. They're supposed to be communities. Originally, the, the idea of an ivory tower. What we do on campus is not what we do in the public square. It, free speech is not natural. Disagreeing civilly is not natural. It takes a very special environment. I think social media has made, has enabled people to be incredibly incredibly cruel with a sense that they are fighting for virtue. They are on the side of right, and therefore they can destroy people. Yes, off campus, it's almost always included with the demand that they be fired, that their career must be ended, because I heard that they said something. And that's the way it is on campus. And that's, that, I think, is new. It's also weird how the public and private conversations have become so different. Yes, um, the hypocrisy. That you'll, yeah. you'll write an argument, say, saying, I, you know, you, if you're crazy enough like me to write such an argument, saying, I have some issues with some of the tactics of Me Too. Immediately, you are a bigot, a sexist, blah, 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 massive hate on Twitter and public media. And then suddenly, in your private email, thank you for saying that. Yes, I'm glad someone else said that. And, <laughs> and it's... it's it's similar on the right, where, ev where everybody in public is saying, yeah, Trump is the best thing. Well, in private, they're saying, well, yeah, he's, he's kind of completely nuts, and I don't know what the hell is going to happen. I mean, this, this, this is not a healthy climate for political debate at all, and, or, or for debate of any kind. And, and it's happening on both sides, and I think there's a way in which it's because people who are in dissent are not being treated as simply representatives of an argument, but are being treated as if they have committed a heresy or if they have committed a crime uh, and are revealing that they're inherently a bad person. I mean, what you just, one thing about how it applies on campus, because I think it's a mistake to sort of 
uh, conflate together what's happening on campus with everything Andrew's talking about. Because I think on campus, with these movements for social justice and racial diversity, like, you know, that's a plastic moment for people. They're young, they're learning, they're kind of testing out these ideas for the first time. They're flexing their power, they're learning how to organize. And I think it's an opportunity where we can influence how they think about these issues, how they think about themselves as individuals, you know, how they think about how to bring about change, whether it's a good idea to try to ban or punish speech. Like their ideas are not set in stone at that point. So it's just sort of love it all together and say, you know, this is part of this retrograde, you know, really uh, dangerous contrary movement that's going to undermine everything about our democracy, I think it's a mistake. Like, I think the better approach is to sort of listen, hear out, explain, engage, and try to convince people that these well, yeah, principles that, and ideas I just have wanna, Can them. I just leave those, contra those contrasting perspectives out there for a moment? Nico, I don't know if we have time for any more questions. We've we got time for two more questions. Okay, do you want to chain them together? Yeah. Yes, uh, okay. let's do these two people right here. Right. <laughs> Andrew, if I could ask you to um, extrapolate a little bit on the, the trends you were just talking about um, and, and think about where, where things go, uh, given the things that you're observing, in particular mostly in university perhaps, but also in the, in the real world and in, in the media world. Where does this go? I mean, does it take, uh, for example, enough uh, people to be sort of uh, consumed by their own revolution for there to, to be a, an end to this uh, inertia, or or how far how far do things go we before got that. this can be reversed? So the second question. <laughs> Um, how do you, hi, thank you. How do you confront somebody that explicitly ex um, uh, comes from a critical theory perspective? I work in academia and education, and that is very pervasive there, and so I'd like some tools to combat that. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know what she's talking about. Um, so maybe someone smarter than me, please uh, address those two questions. Oh boy. Well, I remember an old joke from the, from the 90s. I, we're in a comedy club, I can actually tell a joke on like the classroom. Um, what do you get when you cross a mafioso and a deconstructionist? Take you know, it. This take one? it. The what? You can't say mafioso. That's a, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. Actually, go no, ahead. No, no, there you go. Yeah. Well, you, you get an offer you can't understand. Um, <laughs> and um, so, as for how what you do when you're working with them, I actually think that you cannot reach them. I, I really think that you cannot reach them. They live in a, a closed epistemic world. Greg Lukianov talks about the perfect rhetorical fortress. So I actually think you, you cannot reach them. Um, now, some of them will outgrow it. They'll have experiences that will show him show them a different way. And there's actually I've started to collect um, like deconversion narratives, people who are deep into this world, this critical theory world, and exactly the world Andrew described, where it's is. all about groups, it's all about oppression. And some of them actually escape because they realize it's like after they do some like five really cruel things to people who didn't do anything wrong, some of them do say, whoa, what was that? And so uh, to, to get back to uh, Daniel's uh, uh, question about where, how does this end, I am seeing signs um, that people are beginning to get burned out. I am seeing, you know, it used to be when I would talk with professors, they'd say, oh, you're cherry picking, oh, it's just a few things. Now when I talk with professors on the left, they almost all have a story about some like they said something perfectly fine in class and then they were attacked for usually racism or some, some other form of bigotry. I think at the present rate, everybody will be accused of racism within about 75 weeks or so. And at that point, at that point, um, then I think we might have more and more people saying, whoa, that was, we, that was too much. You know, the same way that the wars of religion burned themselves out in Europe and finally we said, you know what, we have to have freedom of religion. I think eventually we might, you know, we might, we might eventually get to the point where people say, well, you know, we, we just have to have free speech. There will come a point at which people who are told that because they're part of a minority, for example, they have to believe this, that, and the other, will at some point say, you know, I don't actually. <laughs> I, I, I disagree with that. You know, they'll have their Kanye moment. And, uh, and after the Kanye moment, they'll hey, have good a... good to see you, Candace Owens. They'll have a... <laughs> they'll, they'll have a Ta-Nehisi Coates moment who will tell them that by differing from their group, they're actually white, not black. And then eventually maybe we'll have a moment where the, when someone will say, that's so lame. It's such a, it's such a violation, uh, uh, so, so uninteresting to define someone's 
perspective and argument entirely by some aspect of their identity as opposed to their uniqueness as a human being, the uniqueness of their own experience. At some point, you see, intersectionality, I think, if it's taken to its fullest uh, conclusion, turns out that everybody is an incredibly different mosaic of a million different identities <laughs> from their family to their background to their culture to their country. And intersectionality taken to its endless degree turns into individuality uh, when you realize that actually... And I, and I think that's, that's the key thing. You know, we do live in America. We do live in a place that enshrined the rights of the individual, that celebrates the rights of the individual. And eventually, I think, against this groupthink and this intimidation and in this false ideology, there will be people that say, I dissent. And that is a great and empowering moment. And I hope that more and more people will say, I dissent. Well, can I just... Can I just stand up for a moment for a political theory now? I, or sorry, excuse me, for a critical theory. I don't do critical theory. I'm not a critical theorist. I do very Someone boring. Someone explain what on earth that is. To, no, to no nice one can. I've tried. A comedy <laughs> club is the right place for that. No, the, um, it, it might be. Let actually. me just say, like, I do very boring stuff about Islamic law. It's very like textual. It's not very theoretical. You know, it's pretty straightforward stuff. I got to tell you, I borrow from critical theory all the time. The insights are real. Now, like any kind of branch, and Jonathan will back me up on this, like any kind of branch of the academy, it has its, its, its nutcases, its lunatics, and its bad scholars. And you know what? The academy is pretty good at identifying those people and rooting them out. Though I'm, I'm not going to try to convince you of that. Tenure? That's pushing up against a, you know, a closed wall. Now, let me just also really say really quickly to Andrew here. You know, Andrew is telling you that uh, the United States is this country that was founded on principles of individual liberty, and it's only maybe with the collapse of the old left and the rise of the new in the 70s that we suddenly discovered that identity is a thing and the politics changed everything. Well, you know what? You know, to bastardize Anatole France here for a moment, law in its majesty used to forbid both gay and straight people alike from marrying someone of the same sex. It's the case that laws that look, or policies that look like they are identity neutral, in fact, do target specific identities. And I think what college students today might be picking up on, and maybe these ridiculous critical theorists might be picking up on, is that there are a lot of policies and a lot of laws out there that look on their face as if they are neutral crack cocaine being punished with the worst sentence than powder cocaine. But when you actually look at how they're applied, identity politics helps us to understand that certain groups really are disproportionately targeted in relationship to that policy, okay? Yeah. And we can, we can pretend, for instance, we can have a conversation about Me Too that is untethered from gender, but it would be an uninformed discussion. We have to have that gender analysis at the heart of the discussion if we're ever going to get off the ground. Identity politics helps us to do that. It gives us the tools. Mm. All right. Uh, Nico, I guess we're at the point where we should do closing statements here? Yep. All righty. You know, this is, this is quite, quite hard for me. I told Nico when he asked me to, to MC or moderate or whatever this thing is that I'm a hell of a lot more Allen Iverson than like whoever the hell just passes the ball instead of shooting it. The, the urge to jump in there, Jeffrey. Holding back. But, but I want to allow you all to close. Perhaps we'll do it in reverse order uh, from when we started. He said, keep it brief. He didn't give me a time limit, but you know, trust your conscience. Um, I'll start with you, Andrew. Andrew. Um, I just want to finish maybe by saying that as a writer, um, I just hope that writers will not be intimidated into writing things that aren't risky, that don't push the envelope, that don't actually address real issues because they're afraid of the social consequences of it. The, the job of a writer is, I think, to be true to yourself and not to adhere to a group or to, or to some ideology that is not entirely owned by yourself. And so here's for radical, offensive, difficult, unexpected ideas and writing that is offered in a culture which is interested in their actual intrinsic value rather than in demonizing and stigmatizing and anathematizing the person, the writer, him or herself. Suzanne? Yeah, okay, a couple quick things. I mean, first of all, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. You know, there are so many new voices. We at PEN America Writers Organization, I couldn't agree more with Andrew that I want to see writers 
dissenting, uh, writing freely, not being intimidated by anybody, whether it's the President of the United States or an online mob. But we see that. We see so many uh, writers, immigrant writers, writers of color, women writers, who are getting their voices out for the first time. It's happening on campus. There are people learning how to protest, how to demonstrate, how to organize, how to mobilize. And so, you know, this could be a moment that we look back on as kind of a positive watershed in some respects for free speech. I think we're also being tested. How do we hold the space open? How do we get our ideas around individual rights across to a new and rising generation? How do we accommodate a demographic revolution while holding on to these constitutional principles that are now, uh, you know, under debate? I think we can do it. I mean, I'm, I'm a positivist, I'm an optimist. I don't think it's we should dismiss or denigrate or despair what's being said uh, or the ideas that are being advanced, but rather we gotta think about, you know, how do we persuade? How do we convince people who, you know, are, are intimidated by hateful speech, people who have the impulse to silence or to punish speech, how do you actually persuade them that that's not going to, you know, in the end get them what they are after or that it could be used against them? And if you engage and you have those arguments, I think most people can understand it. So, you know, rather than sort of declaring a crisis and throwing our hands up, I think the work that we're all doing to engage these debates on campus ultimately could lead to a situation where we have a much more open campus to a far greater variety of people, but one that is also uh, remains open to uh, the fullest breadth of ideas. So uh, at Heterodox Academy, our mission statement is uh, to improve the quality of research and education in universities by increasing viewpoint diversity, mutual understanding, and constructive disagreement. Um, I think what we've had here today is about as good as it gets for constructive disagreement. I think this was great fun for us all. Um, so I want to, I want to thank my, my fellow panelists for being spirited, uh, all coming from different perspectives, being passionate. Uh, there was not a single ad hominem argument, because I think my chutzpah thing wasn't, ex it wasn't, wasn't ad hominem. That was, that was, yeah, okay. Um, and uh, and, and I, I think I, 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 uh, what I hope will come from this is that the four of us may even write something about this evening or about this kind of discussion. I think a lot, of, a, a lot can come from this, this evening itself. Um, so I'd like to just close with a, a quote from my new favorite philosopher, John Stuart Mill, uh, who said, uh, both teachers and learners go to sleep at their post as soon as there is no enemy in the field. That is, we need, a, we need people to challenge us. We, 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 we too easily fall into orthodoxy. He also wrote about the fatal tendency of mankind to leave off thinking about a thing when it is no longer doubtful. Uh, and he spoke of the deep slumber of a decided opinion. So whatever opinion you came in today, uh, uh, whether you came in thinking that there was obviously a free speech crisis or there was obviously not a free speech crisis, I hope you heard something that woke you up. And I, I don't mean that you became woke, but I mean that you see new possibilities uh, for thinking. Uh, and I, I hope and expect that we will all leave this room uh, smarter and maybe a bit more optimistic about the, the, the possible turnarounds or at least the chances for improvement of our intellectual climate. Thank you. Well, I don't know how much there is more to say. Um, it's crazy to think that I'm here today because of uh, a tweet I sent out a few months back. The lesson here, kids, is keep tweeting because that is how you get on this side of the table. It's a, it's a win-win proposition. But, um, you know, in a couple of days, I'm going to go back home to Canada, and I'm going to start teaching. I teach courses in the summer, too. And the students I interact with, guys, they are normal students. Most students are normal people. They, they walk amongst us. They could be in this room right now. You're, you're from language, Canada. In Canada, that's right. <laughs> of course they're normal. It's rural Canada. Uh, you know, the, the, the kind of the language of crisis, I'm not saying there's not a problem. I think that, that's something that, that Suzanne would agree with. There are problems on campus. But the language of crisis really gives license to people and to policies that would restrict speech further, that would damage the integrity of the, of the campus community further. And all I want to ask is we go through our lives trying to be as skeptical as possible, to really look at the evidence, to not be suckered in by something that just flashes again and again from our friends on social media. I'm asking you to take that same kind of philosophy of skepticism with you when you face the next you know, free speech crisis that erupts the next time someone gets shouted down or heckled at a talk. These things happen, they are a problem, and they need to be addressed, but that kind of language of alarm will actually do so much more damage otherwise. So thank you.
Nico, any uh, parting shots, closing business we got to take care of before we get out of here? Nope. Fifth column. Yay. Awesome. Yes. The podcast, the fifth column. Well, thank you so much for every, to everyone. Uh, thank you again to our panelists. They were phenomenal. Super interesting. Thank you to our raspy voice moderator. Thank you to everybody here. Have a good night, folks. Thank you.